Good afternoon. Man, I was really blessed with what Alden shared with us just prior, you know, especially in the testimony about his son and his son's loss and how the Lord used that. And just, um, you know, that 2 Corinthians 1, that God comforts us in our affliction so that would be a comfort to other people who are similarly afflicted with the comfort that's been given to us. That God comforts us never to make us comfortable, but always so that it would be sown back into the body. And uh, I just I was really blessed by what Alden shared. Let's just open up in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, go through your word this afternoon. And I pray for Mark's uh, workshop and for Rose's workshop. And Lord, I pray more than anything that your word would be rightly divided and that, uh, that you would give me your clarity in... Uh, what you'd have a share, just that it, it would be less of me and, and more of you. I pray for your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you have your Bibles, we'll go to 2 Corinthians 8, second, uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 to 13. I'm going to be reading from uh, the NIV translation but whatever version you love to read, that's my favorite version. <laughs> Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you've proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, or of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. If you have the NASB translation there, it says, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. Your earnestness, your devotion, your spude is the word there, but it's your zeal and your, your carefulness, your, your diligence. By verse 13, by all this we're encouraged in addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. There are certainly times and circumstances where we're in situations and we get to choose from a variety of good options. Maybe you're even familiar with situations that you've been in where you have the option to choose between what's better and what's best. Times where you can have a win-win compromise, a win-win Solution. Sorrow, sorrow, and how we process sorrow as Christ followers is not choosing from many good options. It's, it's a, a demonstration, it's, it's a working, it's a, it's a sanctification that ultimately leads to life or death. Sorrow, in, in our course of, of working through it, our response to it is a matter of life or death. It's not a win-win situation. It's a life or death ultimatum. As an elder here at Faith Fellowship Church, this, this passage, this book of 2 Corinthians, this letter that Paul wrote has a particular weight to it. It has a weight because as you read Paul's epistle here, there's a, there's a heartache and there's a heartbreak that Paul expresses through this whole letter. I think about how I've used and referenced this passage, how I have instructed others with it, and how it has filleted me for the better part of the last 12 years, especially in regards to James 1.19. I appreciate that Alden referenced James 1.19 in his previous talk. You know, in the Amplified Bible, James 1.19 says, Understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear. Be, be a careful, thoughtful listener. Be slow to speak, a speaker of carefully chosen words. 
and be slow to anger, be patient and reflective and forgiving. Be a, being a careful, thoughtful listener to what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth and he's saying to us, demands that we slow down, demands that we slow down and we understand the context in these verses. This, this heartbreak, this heartache that Paul chronicles in this letter, I mean, it starts right in chapter 1, verse 4, and he talks about his affliction. And then in verse 5, he talks about his sufferings. And then in verse 6, he talks again about his affliction. And then in verse 8, his affliction, being burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we even despaired even of life. In verse 9, Paul says, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. In verse 10, he's delivered again from a great peril, a peril of death. And we're in the very beginning of this epistle and we get the picture that Paul's in the midst of persecution. And then chapter 4 and verse 8, he, he continues to chronicle some of this. He says, we're afflicted in every way. We're, we're not crushed. We're perplexed but not despairing. We're persecuted but not forsaken. We're struck down but not destroyed. We're always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus. It's to say that he's on the brink of death for the same reason that Jesus gave his life. It's because he's preaching the truth. He says so in verse 11. We're constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. In verse 12, the death works in us. Over in chapter 6, he goes through this litany again. In verse 4, he talks about the endurance through afflictions and hardships and distresses. And in verse 5, the beatings and the imprisonments and the tumults and the labors and the sleeplessness and the hunger. And then again in chapter 11, throughout this letter, we have these detailed descriptions of Paul's torment. It's especially important because as I speak today on behalf of the Fellowship of Biblical Counselors to, to understand that, that, we, that our passion is to train counselors under the authority of their local church, under the authority of their own pastor. We're not parachurch, we're for your church, in your church, under your pastoral authority as a ministry aid. I'm thankful for the pastors that are here, I'm thankful for the ones that are watching online, I'm thankful that Jeff Cologne serves as our executive director but first serves as pastor in his church. This passage in 2 Corinthians that we're working through is especially comforting to pastors and shepherds who've suffered the consequence or are suffering the consequence of having spoken truth and love to their sheep. Pastors who have stayed true to the gospel despite the brokenness of severed relationships that may result. Anyone, anyone in ministry could speak very plainly about the anguish because of difficulty in relationships between sheep and shepherd, between people and pastor, between counselee and counsellor. That's where we find Paul as he writes this in 2 Corinthians. There's not a pastor who doesn't know the grief of the pain that comes to heart when people that you invest in the most return the least. And that's why I want to make sure that we carefully and rightly divide this passage to make it practically applicable for us. As we work through this passage, we have to biblically understand sorrow and joy. We have to understand biblically what's the opposite of joy. If I asked most people on the street, hey, what, what's the opposite of joy? Many would respond, the opposite of joy is grief or sorrow. And I'd say, well, let's go to 1 Peter 1.6. I mean, Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by your various trials. Grief and joy, grief and joy can be present simultaneously without problem. Sorrow in and of itself doesn't need to spoil joy. Two things that can't be present simultaneously are joy and sin. As soon as sin enters and takes control, joy departs. And to get joy back, sin has to be confessed and forsaken. 
that's not just my uh, reference as your speaker this afternoon. That's Solomon's wisdom in the book of Proverbs. That's Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. The opposite of joy isn't sorrow. The opposite of joy is sin. And as we go through these verses, one of the things I want to really encourage us is that these verses are not intended to weaponize the Bible. What I mean is I don't want us to take these verses and then pick them up and aim them at individuals or counselees who don't agree with us, effectively trying to throw God at them or you know, forcefully use God's name as a way to get what I want, to manipulate a situation. I want us to be very careful about disagreeing with people over our preferences and then patting ourselves on the back because we're deceived about what is really God's work. We pick the wrong battleground and we fight on the, on the battleground of culture and then we attack with God's word. And I, I don't mean through this that we condone sinful behavior. We don't condone sinful behavior. Jesus never condones or excuses the behavior of the adulterous woman in John 8. In fact, he, he puts himself in harm's way. He gets between her and the crowd so that she has an opportunity to embrace forgiveness to embrace healing. And once she has that opportunity, Jesus speaks very clearly to her, go and sin no more. That, that's what love does. Love embraces weakness and creates an opportunity for healing instead of weaponizing at the first sign of fault. I, I know this is right. I know this is right because Jesus was so clear about how the world would know us as his disciples. John 13, 35 says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I pray, I, I pray diligently that, that as much as your counselees are impressed at how well you know the Bible or how uh, appreciative they are of the homework that you personalize for them that rightly divides scripture and meeting their needs, how your counselees may respect your faithfulness and your reliability and the accountability that comes in your counseling sessions, I'm praying for you that your counselees would be overwhelmed by how much you love them. That God's love through you would overflow to your counseling and your discipling and your ministry to your counselees. As mom and dads, that God's love would flow through you and overwhelm your children. As sons and daughters, that God's love would flow through you and overwhelm your mom and dad. And this passage that we're going through in 2 Corinthians 7 is more than just eight things to do to get through the mess that I'm in. And it certainly is not a checklist to be used as leverage between spouses or injured parties of, hey, do this or else. But what this passage does do for us very clearly is teach us plainly that godly sorrow is tangible. That godly sorrow is tangible. That the actions of our counselee's repentance proves them to be clear. It isn't words or feelings that proves the counselee or the sinner to be clear, it's actions. It's actions. That godly sorrow leads to repentance. That it's a sorrow that leads to a change of purpose, change of intention, a change of action. I was reminded going through this how often my mom would say to me while I was in high school and through college, she'd say, Bri, your actions speak so loudly that I can't even hear what you're saying. I love Redpath's commentary on this book, his, his book, uh, Studies in 2 Corinthians, Blessings Out of Buffetings. He says, what is godly sorrow? What is godly sorrow? It's not the sorrow of idle tears. It's not crying by your bedside because once again you have failed, nor is it vain regret, wishing 
things had never happened, wishing you could live the moments again. No, it's not that. It's a change of purpose and intentions, a change of direction and action. And when we think about repentance biblically, we define it as a change of mind. That, that, that's the literal etymological definition of the Greek word repentance. Repentance comes from meta to change, from uh, noio, the way, the way that we think. But in that, by, by defaulting to, well, repentance is changing the way that we think, we can be deceived into thinking that repentance is only an intellectual alteration, an understanding, an acknowledgement that, yes, I have sinned, and I'm going to think about things differently from now on. But, but the mind that's changed in repentance refers to our inner man. The, the mind and heart, biblically, are often used interchangeably. And so, yeah, re, I would agree. Repentance begins with that intellectual recognition and confession of sin, but it doesn't end there. There's also a change of heart. There's a change of heart. There's, there's an emotional component in that change of heart where the, the believer mourns over having sinned against the God whom he loves and loves him. That's why David cries out so clearly in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 10 11 from the New King James Version says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And then the, these observations. Ob observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What indignation. The clearing of yourselves. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. All of these things work together to show and demonstrate that the sorrow of the Corinthian Christians worked real repentance. And that's the heartbreak in Paul. That, that's why he says, you know, clearly in 2 Corinthians 2, listen, I wanted to come to you again, but I, I didn't want to have another painful visit. It was so hurtful the last time he was in the church at Corinth. The, the, the Corinthian church had started to turn against Paul, and there was separation there. So Paul doesn't want to go back and have a painful visit, so he sends Titus. He sends Titus with this, with this message, with what he wants to convey to the church. And Titus is received, and there's the, the demonstration of the church having repented. He says what diligence, you know, that godly sorrow produces and repentance displays or shows diligence. Repentance is to turn around. Diligence is to stay turned around. If we just continue to give up easily, we can never walk in repentance, even though I may perform acts of repentance. I mean, this is what Ephesians 4 is about. Having put off because we've renewed our mind through God's word, through the power of his Holy Spirit, and having had our minds renewed, we put on. It's not just changing behavior. It's coming from having a changed heart, from that metamorphosis of the Holy Spirit changing us from inside out. And then that idea of clearing yourselves, that godly sorrow produces and repentance shows a clearing, a clearing of guilt and shame. Knowing that we brought our sin to God and now we walk in the right way. That, that promise of 1 John 1, 9. That when we confess our sins, that God's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's no more excuses. There's no more blame shifting. It's a clear admission of guilt and there's a motivation to receive correction and all of it leads to a changed heart. What indignation. What indignation. The godly sorrow produces and repentance shows indignation. That we become outraged. Agonoctesis. Agonoctesis is the word there. And it's, it's a very strong, it's a physical pain. It's, a, it's a, an irritation. It's very much to grieve. We grieve at ourselves and for our foolishness and sin. We want nothing to do of revisiting that place or going back to that place. It's a changed heart through the power of the Holy Spirit that makes repentance last. 
that I'm, I'm more mad at my own sin than I am at my accusers, that I'm thankful for the ones holding me accountable. What fear? Godly sorrow produces and repentance shows a fear, a fear that we would ever fall into the same sin again. It's not a fear of God. It's a fear of sin. It's a fear of our own weakness towards sin. It's not making any provision for the flesh. A vehement desire. Godly sorrow produces and repentance shows a vehement desire. It's a heart that desires purity and godliness. It renews vulnerable relationships and builds trust and affection. It, it's a total dependence on God. And, and what zeal? Godly sorrow produces and repentance shows zeal. Heat there, that is a, it's a Greek word for heat. And, and we're hot towards God and his righteousness. And we're hot against sin and impurity. And instead of laziness, we have a passion in our walk with the Lord. And vindication. Godly sorrow produces and repentance displays a vindication. That we're vindicated as Christians even though we have sinned. No one doubts... No one doubts vindication because the measure of a Christian is never not whether or not they sin, but it's whether or not they repent. It's whether or not they repent. And then we prove ourselves to be clear. When repentance is marked by those characteristics that Paul observes and lays out, that, that it, it, it indicates a clearing of guilt and, and sin, that the stain of sin is gone. And, we, and I can feel it, and other people can see it. One of the things that I loved in preparing for the time we were going to have together this afternoon was to read Charles Spurgeon's sermon on this passage. He delivered it in, in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in July of 1881. But one of the ways he summarizes this passage, Spurgeon says, Happy is that man who's had enough of the sting of sin to make it sour and bitter to him all the rest of his days, so, now, so that now with changed heart and renewed spirit, he perseveres in the ways of God, never thinking of going back, but resolved. Resolved through floods or flames to force his way into heaven to be, by divine grace, master over every sin that assails him. By divine grace, master over every sin that assails him. I want to make sure we unpack that. Because that's key to, to understanding this whole passage. In fact, if you had heard me teach through this passage over the last 10 years or so, I would spend a lot of time here using a specific biblical text to illustrate and exemplify godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. In fact, you can hardly pick up a counseling commentary on 2 Corinthians 7 and godly sorrow and worldly sorrow without having the illustration of Peter and Judas and how they deal with their sin being the textbook, the biblical text example of Judas' demonstration of worldly, sorrow, of worldly sorrow that leads to his suicide and Peter's demonstration of godly sorrow that leads to his ministry. The stark contrast. And I certainly don't mean to, to diminish, and I would never want to disrespect any of that teaching. But we can look a little bit deeper. Because we understand biblically that both Judas and Peter committed heinous sins on the same night. Judas led the guard to Jesus in the garden. Peter publicly disowned Jesus in the courtyard. You know, I pray that as you, as you uh, use... Peter and Judas in your counseling, that you, you never lose hold of what Luke says in Luke 22. You know, that, that truth that when Peter disowns Jesus in the courtyard, that Luke records very clearly that Jesus turns, that Jesus turns, and he looks at Peter. He's within eye shot of Peter. And he sees Peter directly. And then the cock crows. And then Peter weeps bitterly. Your, your counselees know this look. I mean, you know this look. I know this look. 
of having sinned with my eyes wide open, thinking that there's some place in my existence that the omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient Savior doesn't see or can't see. The Lord sees us in our sin and our rejection of his ways, and it strikes us with grief. I, I, I've thought about, what, what, what was it? What, what's Peter's response there? You know, is it, is it Jesus in, in, in that view of seeing Peter and having that prophecy fulfilled that Peter would deny him three times and that look of Jesus saying, I told you so. There's no way. There's no way that Jesus was gloating over Peter's failure because he's on the cross to pay the penalty for it. I doubt that Jesus looked at Peter with anger. I mean, we're told clearly that Jesus doesn't break a bruised reed or snuff out a smoking candle. And I doubt it was even Jesus looking at him with that incredulous thought of how could you. Jesus didn't come to communicate personal hurts. He didn't come to burden us with guilt. He came to deliver us from that. That look, that look that Peter experiences is pure and holy love. I mean, I get it. I, I, I get that in my flesh I would want to see anger or disappointment or I told you so. But Jesus looks at us and he looks at our counselees and it is a demonstration of unfeigned and unblemished love. I get that. I get Peter turning away and weeping bitterly. But turning away and weeping bitterly is one of Peter's greatest mistakes. Because if he continues to look, if we continue to look, if we continue to encourage our counselees to keep their gaze fixed on Christ, they would see Christ's love and its pardon and its cleansing and it relieves guilt and removes shame and it heals the broken. It's Jesus looking in Peter's face, indicating, come unto me. It's the same call that Jesus gives each one of us and gives our counselees. Both Peter and Judas betrayed Christ. Both Peter and Judas display deep regret over what they'd done. Peter is forgiven and goes on to preach at Pentecost. Judas ends up committing suicide. And what I want to make sure that we understand and we take away from this passage, and when we're reading those commentaries that are using these examples, that we understand biblically that the difference between Judas and Peter is much more than their grit. It's much more than Peter's resolve and Judas's giving up. There, there's a couple of definite practical applications, and this is what I've just been praying for, that the Lord would just make this resonant with us, that we'd be able to minister to our families and to our counselees, to our kids who are hurting, to people that we're discipling. One of the things we can take away so clearly that's applicable in this, this comparison, this contrast between Peter and Judas and this worldly sorrow and godly sorrow is to understand where Judas goes with his sorrow and regret. I mean, I love it. I love it that the Holy Spirit includes it for our edification, for our growth. Because Matthew records it in Matthew 27, verses 1 to 5. That the morning came and all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then in verse 3, Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful. Judas is sorry. Judas has sorrow. I mean, Matthew's telling us. He's remorseful. And he brings back the 30 pieces of silver. Where does he bring them? to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they say, what's that to us? You see to it. And he throws down the pieces of silver in the temple and departs and went and hanged himself. And, and the thing that I always try to convey when I'm counseling through this passage is that Judas goes back and confesses his sin. He demonstrates his sorrow. He does it to the same crew 
that collaborated with him in the sin. He goes back to the same mess. He goes back, and, and, and Scripture is so clear, right? 1 Corinthians 15, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. 1 John 4, 1, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits, whether they're of God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. 2 Corinthians 6, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What, has, uh, what communion has light with darkness? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5, I wrote to you not to keep company with sexually immoral people. I don't mean the people of the world, the extortioners, the idolatries, because you need to go out of the world. But I'm telling you for people who are in the church, with, with anyone who's named a brother who's sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. And not only times with counselees where they're really struggling to make that clean break, that radical amputation from sin and separate from the people that, that they've, they've conspired with in that, that's where they go back to how to fix the mess that they're in. The people that brought them into that mess can't help them get out of it. And that's one of the things that we take away from Judas here. Very clearly, Judas demonstrates, he says all the right things. He just doesn't go to the right people. I mean, Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise. The companion of fools will be destroyed. This is what I love to encourage my counselees with from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. I'm never, I'm never surprised the counselees seek advice from the ones who accompany them into the pit, you know, instead of running from them in the opposite direction. But I have to be patient, we have to be good listeners, and we have to be slow to speak, but we have to bring them back to what is godly sorrow, and godly sorrow, as we just read through that list of descriptors, that there's indignation, and there's zeal, and there's fear, and that's running away from sin and its companions to Christ, and to Christ followers, to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Christ. Whenever my counselees are trying to get advice from their old crews or their old way of thinking, their old way of decision making, I just want to help bring them to Jesus. Right? I want to bring them to John 14, 15, where Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And then he's, Jesus says in John 15, 14, you're my friends if you do what I command you. And, and that promise in John 14 that looks forward, not backward, Right, Judas is looking back to the same sinful, hardened against God people that he conspired with that we're continually challenging our, our counselees to, to identify where does hope come from? Where does help come from? Where does wise counsel come from? Jesus says in John 14, verses 16 and 17, I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another helper. That helper will be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world can't receive because it doesn't see him or know him. But you know him. He dwells with you. He'll be in you. Man, it's, gra it's grace. It's, when, the difference between Judas and Peter is not their grit. It's grace. It's grace. Look at what Jesus says to Peter in Luke 22. Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. When you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. And, and that's where we understand the difference between Peter and Judas. Both of them are tempted in points of weakness, Underneath the non-repentance of Judas and the repentance and faith of Peter is Luke 22, verse 32. The difference is the prayer of Jesus. That Jesus prays for Peter. Jesus prays for Peter. 
I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. When you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus prayed for Peter, and he prays for you, and he prays for your counselees. That, that's Romans 8. Romans 8, 34. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Your toughest counseling cases, Jesus is interceding for them. Your strained marriages, Jesus is interceding for them. This strained relationship between Paul and the church, Jesus is interceding. It's Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We can never take for granted the intercession of our Savior. It's not just that Jesus died for us. It's not just that he was raised for us. But it's also that he lives to intercede for us. And the ones who you're counseling, the ones who you love, there's Jesus speaking into his Father's ear. Keep him from breaking, Lord. Keep their faith from failing. Bring them to repentance. Jesus lives to intercede. And that stands between us and the enemy set against us. Jesus' intercession is more powerful than any evil. His prayers are invincible. That, that's why I love in Luke 22 in that verse where Jesus says, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And then he prays, when you have turned again. When you have turned again. I, I love that. I love that. P Jesus knows Peter. He knows he's going to go through this three-time denial. And the last time, he's going to curse, saying, I've never even met him. So many counselees that I've ministered to and spoken with have the same potential struggle that Peter has after this colossal failure. And it's that doubt, that wondering, have I ever been a Christian? Was it ever really real? Was anything that I ever said or heard true? And there's Jesus. I've prayed for you, Peter. When you turn again, when you repent, not if you repent, not maybe, not I hope you repent, but when you repent. And then at the end, when you've turned again, here's what I want you to do. I want you to strengthen your brothers. Man, if I can encourage you as counselors, this, this is where I would encourage you. It's one of the sweetest truths that we can speak to one another, that we encourage one another with, that, to take the kindness that Christ has shown us, to understand that he's the one who's opened our eyes to sin. He's the one who's given us the gift of repentance. And how do we repay? How do we recompense for that? We strengthen our brethren. We go and tell one another how Jesus changed our heart and strengthens us. And we come alongside them. Jesus says, strengthen your brethren. Peter, that's what you can do. That's our hope. That's our hope. Our hope is that every counselee becomes a counselor, that every disciple becomes a discipler. It's that 2 Corinthians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. That we may be able to comfort them with the comfort with which we ourselves were comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. And that each one of us, counselors, moms, dads, sons, daughters, that we would tell one another how Jesus changed our heart. And that we would use that to strengthen others.
And I think out of all that we can take out of 2 Corinthians 7, one of the things that I think is the most beautiful part of this passage, that in addition to godly sorrow producing life, that in addition to godly sorrow producing life, look at what it produces for Paul. In 2 Corinthians 7, verses 4 to 7, And Paul says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. We came into Macedonia. Our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comfort us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. See, not only did the Corinthians display zeal in their repentance, but their repentance led to their restoration and their reconciliation and their relationship with Paul. And the example we get from 2 Corinthians 7 is that godly sorrow heals sinners and it heals our relationships. Amen? Amen. There's a, a sheet on the notes there that you can just work through with your counselees when, they're, uh, when you're going through their PDI and you're examining, hey, is this just, are you here with me because you're sorry you got caught? Or are you here with me because you know that as much as God loves you and Jesus sacrificed for you, that you've rebelled against him? that you've sinned against him. That's always where we want to have that encouragement with our counselees is, hey, you know what? This is life and death. This isn't a joke. This is worldly sorrow that leads to death. It's godly sorrow that leads to life. Pray that God would grant godly sorrow. Amen? Amen.